Hello and welcome to the very first Robert White Facebook Live event. Uh, my name's Ian and uh, this evening we are incredibly fortunate to have Carl Taylor with us. Uh, he's going to be running through his creative process uh, from conception through to completion uh, with an emphasis on using leaf filters products. Uh, not only the traditional filters that you may find with landscape photography, but uh, some lighting gels as well and, and other bits and pieces that you may not normally associate with using filters and gels. Um, Carl has an incredibly diverse uh, portfolio of work um, and it's not just landscape photography, it's uh, commercial work as well. And some types of the commercial work you wouldn't necessarily associate filter use, especially in the studio. Um, before I hand over to Carl, just to remind everyone that this is a live event. Uh, I will be doing my best to monitor the comments and questions. And uh, as, as the uh, talk continues, I'll relay those over to Carl as, as and when. Um, it is my first Facebook Live event, so please be kind, please bear with me. And if I miss your comments, I do apologise beforehand. Right, OK, over to you, Carl. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to present a slideshow of my work. So I'm going to share my screen and just check that uh, this is working and just get this started. So what I'm going to do uh, tonight is just talk to you a little bit about my history, uh, about my background, and then run through various um, elements of my work from commercial work, studio, fashion, product, but also some landscape. And we're going to look at some of the scenarios where I use Lee filter products. Um, and of course, I'm happy to talk about um, other products that I use as well from cameras, lenses, et cetera. And I, I believe Ian's going to take uh, any questions and pass them on. Um, so I'm afraid I can't see any of the questions at my end. That's um, uh, what Ian's got control of. Um, so I've titled this talk show um, Concept to Completion because it's very much the way I work. I often uh, conceive an idea, pre-visualize that idea, sketch it, plan it, figure it out, work out all of the uh, elements that are going to need, be needed to make the image a success and then work through from that uh, process. Now that's somewhat different to landscape photography in many ways, but I still actually apply it in some respects to that as well. But let's jump back in time a little bit in, in history where it all started. And actually for me, it all started with this image. This photograph I shot in around about 1986, 87. It was my... Um, first introduction to SLR cameras. This was shot on a Minolta X700 with a 500 millimeter Tamron lens, which was the catadioptric a mirror lens. And you can see that from the donut pattern on the highlights. And this was the very first roll of film that I put through an SLR camera. And um, when I had the film processed and looked at the results, I was amazed by this thing called photography and freezing time and I just became addicted to it. I came from an art background, art and design background, and then I basically shifted all of my focus and energy into photography. Then some years later, um, this chap with uh, a little bit more hair than I've got now, um, some years earlier, this is back in the mid nineties, I was working freelance as a photojournalist. So I was operating in the jungles of Southeast Asia, mostly in Indonesia. Uh, often up to my knees in mud, covered in leeches and mosquitoes. Uh, the photo on the right, I'm uh, with um, some of the tribes from the uh, Highland Valleys in uh, Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya. And I spent uh, a few years uh, traveling around the, uh, the world, but also mostly in Southeast Asia, documenting cultures and people. And this was some of my work from the time. This was all shot on a Canon F1 or a Canon T90 uh, with Kodachrome 64 film was my most common used film uh, back in the day. And then I would uh, sell these stories to magazines, newspapers, and um, occasionally write articles uh, alongside them as well. So very much more a photojournalistic role. 
Here's some of the tribes that I spent time with in uh, Indonesia. This is the Mentawi tribe in the island of Sibirut off the coast of Sumatra. And um, this was a fascinating period of my life, but this was actually before I became interested or introduced to lighting. This was all just natural light reportage, maybe a little bit of fill in flash with speed lights, etc. cetera. Uh, started using uh, filters as well in my work from polarizing filters, graduated filters. And then I transitioned into studio photography um, almost accidentally by um, taking an assisting job after I did a stint working freelance as a photojournalist, um, realized how difficult it was to make a living from that. And I ended up assisting in a big commercial studio. And that's where I started to learn my interest in lighting. Here, this is around 1997. And this is my uh, studio at the time. Um, I've got Ellen Crompax, a Sinar 5x4 film camera, a couple of Mamiya RZs on the floor there and the Canon F1 and the T90 that I was speaking about. This is my early commercial work, very early commercial work shot on five by four film. Um, you know, my work, I would say, is a lot more refined now, but I was shooting at the time for a lot of um, uh, industrial clients, manufacturers, various ad agencies trying to grow my uh, client list at the time. Uh, and back in that day, we had to do everything in camera so the two pictures you see on screen now uh, didn't use photoshop it was actually multiple exposures in the shot on the left um, so that image with the circuit the chips flying off the circuit board uh, was all done by multiple exposures in camera onto the same sheet of five by four film and the image on the right was shot using a wire going down the back of the leaf. The leaf was glued to a cardboard surface and then the wire ran under the water out the back of the tray. Uh, and that's how it was uh, basically suspended. So we always had to solve problems in camera back then. And that same process, I continued on through my career. Here's me working with various uh, colleagues and assistants on different shoots and in different studios over the years. I've now been doing this for nearly 30 years in total. Again, here's some of my early commercial work, again, featuring in-camera multiple exposures on the left. Um, and then my work progressed, started winning more uh, clients, larger clients, and shooting a lot of stock images as well. And um, here's some of my sort of more refined commercial work, but even this was from maybe 15 years ago. And, um, uh, here's my colleague in one of my oldest studios with me. And uh, now we've moved to a um, much larger studio because my education business has grown, my commercial clients have grown, and the larger space allows us to cover both aspects of the business. And this is my sort of current style of work. It's very much more, as I say, refined. Uh, very much more clarity, I would say, applied. And this has really just come with experience and probably more attention to my lighting skills and more knowledge of lighting. So one of the things I've done over the last 10 years is really invest in my own um, training, if you like, in terms of my knowledge of lighting and understanding the properties of light, physics of light, how light works, um, and applying that to uh, my current work. Interestingly, this picture here was actually for Lee filters and for Panavision, which was to promote the um, IRND range of filters when they launched them. And uh, you can see them laying on the, uh, the foreground area there, but they were targeted for digital um, cine cameras. So uh, hence the background props in the shot. Um, a lot of my work uses Lee filters. For example, this shot here was an 11 second exposure of an assistant moving a light tube around my model while my model held still and then firing my bronze color flashes at the model during the 11 second exposure. But to do that, I had to switch with a Lee neutral density filter 
part way through the exposure. So to get the exposure level correct for the fluorescent tube, I had a leaf filter over the lens and then that was quickly removed before the flash burst was fired. So even in studio and, and fashion work, often, you know, I'm bringing uh, leaf filters into play. Here's another great example. This is a commercial project for Dean flooring. And here I was having real problems with revealing the texture in the materials of the wood uh, without getting glare off of the, the material of the artificial wood. So here I used Lee polarizing gel filters on my studio lights so that I could control that texture and reflections off the slightly glossy surface of the artificial wood. So even in my lighting, I'm using Lee um, uh, uh, equipment, if you like, regularly as well. Quick question, um, here's, Carl. Yes, of course. Um, when you're using polarizing gels on the lights, is there a reason for using them on the lights and, and not on the camera lens for, for that sort of setup? Oh, actually, yeah, you use them on both. Uh, you can use them on both, so you can polarize the light and then polarize on the lens, but often you want to only polarize one part of the image, not the whole image. So if you've got the polarizer on the lens, then you're polarizing everything, whereas as you can see in this setup from that shoot where I've got, um, you know, two or three lights, I can choose to polarize just one particular light that's causing me a problem I rather see. than polarize the entire set, if you see what I mean. Right, yeah, I understand, I see. Um, so that's a typical setup in the studio, being worked with scrims, and even the scrims that you see there, the material that is on those scrims is a diffusion paper, which is made by Lee, and it's called Lee 216 Diffusion, um, which is a really nice quality for softening the light and creating beautiful gradients of light. <clears throat> Uh, other examples here is where I take fashion on location. And basically, I take my lighting on location. This was shot in Iceland. And if you want to see how this was achieved, you can see from that behind the scenes shot that we had the model on a trampoline uh, jumping in the air and then the lighting either side, which allowed us to get that shot. Now, often what I get in that, as you'll see in the daylight scene, you can see the daylight is a lot brighter than the actual scene. So I increase my shutter speed uh, right up to, you know, a thousandth of a second on the medium format camera because it will still sync. And then I often also use a graduated filter over the sky, but then I increase the intensity of one of the studio lights on the model uh, to compensate for the graduated filter, but then still benefit from the graduated filter on the sky. So um, that's, uh, you know, one of the sort of tricks and the same sort of thing that's applied here. Now, the interesting thing, you see these sort of dramatic scenes with these beautiful models and these eerie, ominous landscapes, and it all looks rather um, inspiring, if you like, uh, with the model's wonderful pose and the flowing dress. But quite often uh, what's interesting is the reality of how we get that shot is quite, uh, quite amusing because if, if you look at the rock on the lower right down here, uh, the actually behind that rock is our assistant blowing a leaf blower that we're using as a wind machine Brilliant. to blow her dress. So this again, just a sort of funny behind the scenes shot, but that's the reality of what was actually going on to get that dress to move like that with um, with the wind machine, so um, quite a difference in uh, in reality from uh, from the actual final photograph. Here's another example where I'd be using um, the Lee graduated filters to darken my sky down, and then using my studio lighting um, on top of that to illuminate my model. Here I've got a big para 222 coming in from the left and I've got two para 88s on the right using very fast flash duration so that when the model's running she is uh, frozen in time you can see the wonderful detail captured with the Hasselblad camera and um, there's the the lighting setup you can see there and you can see how bright the sky actually is in reality and this is where using the Lee filters even on my fashion shoots works really, really well. And then all you have to do is overlight 
on your top lighting on the model to cancel out, if you like, the filter, and then the filter will still have effect on the sky because uh, that's obviously not affected by the flash that we're adding yeah, on, so on the scene. Whenever you're ready. So here's a little bit of a clip. We can sort of see what's going on, how the model's running, and then we're shooting the shots. So this is where you need that fast flash yeah. duration to sort of freeze the, uh, the action. When, when you're shooting, great... so, sorry, Carl, when you're shooting very low from a low angle and the model's obviously way above the, the horizon line, what sort of hard hardness of grad would you use for that? I, I pretty much always use soft grads. Um, I don't use hard grads because often in the scene, as was the case in that one, there's rocks sticking up as right. well into the scene and other objects. So I very rarely use hard grads unless I've got just a completely flat horizon. But okay. because most of my work isn't like that, yeah. um, I'd say, yeah, my mainstays are actually the 0 0.3 soft grad. Right. Then I use the uh, IRND three stop and two stop filters. And I also use the Lee polarizing filters as well right. and this is a good example because this one's a combination of filters here i've got the three stop solid nd glass filter the pro glass and a graduated filter and then i managed to achieve through that filtration of um, using the three stops and the grad i managed to achieve a two second uh, camera exposure and then the model just holds her pose for me for the two seconds, you can see a tiny little bit of movement on the dress where that's flickered in the wind. Um, but generally, because it's a wide angle shot and the model's not super close up, you don't really notice any minor movement. But then the two seconds exposure that I'm able to capture from the using that filtration means I can get that flowing water effect for the motion in the shot, but freezing the model with the, with the flash in the foreground. Yeah, I, um, I love this people... image. I, I actually saw um, the the uh, the video when you were creating that shot, and the, the model did incredibly well. <laughs> incredibly oh, she well. was yeah, absolute superb model. Her name uh, Santa Rosina. Really good model. She's modelled for some 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 big clients uh, over the years, and um, she was a, a superb model on that yeah. on that project. Um, the next shot's interesting because this one shows that you don't always have to go far from home. I mean, I actually shot this one locally on my island of Guernsey. And um, what I did here was, again, relying on the Lee filters because I'm using the three stop point, uh, the 0 0.9 Pro Glass ND filter. This is the IRND one, which is so perfectly neutral. I even use it in my studio, where, as a matter of fact, I was using it today on a, on a shoot. Um, but here I'm uh, obtaining a long exposure. You can see on the motion in the water in the shoreline at the back. And then I've got two para 88s on the right with some assistance holding those on some rocks. And you can see how I'm freezing the model for the most part with the flash and even freezing one of the, the waves that's breaking in there and the, and the, um, the foam around the model because that's um, captured in the flashlight. But in the distance, the longer exposure records the motion of the water. So again, it's a combination of long exposure with flash and the flash doing the freezing and the um, Lee filters doing, allowing me to reach these longer exposures um, with, uh, with the in, in camera with flash basically. Um, that one was actually in a very strong gale. It was like four, seven or eight gale blowing. Um, and again, that model did tremendously well. Um, this is just other general in studio commercial work, some of uh, my sort of fashion and beauty work. Again, here um, we, we're using um, the big paras, para 88s, building sets. Um, this one doesn't use any uh, uh, particular uh, Lee filter products, but I thought I'd also show some of my other work. This is one that we just shot recently. And it's interesting, um, shots like that, actually, people look at it and think, oh, that, that, that looks nice. But then they don't necessarily understand the complexity involved in creating that shot. So, for example, to get those soaps to sit like that, they all had to be glued very carefully in position. We actually built a little scaffold bar at the back with acrylic rods 
glued the soap to the acrylic rods to get the top soap to balance on the other one. And then uh, we had to then uh, obtain the right bubble mixture until we got the bubbles absolutely right and then started scooping the bubbles with a spoon onto the products. And you know, before you know it, five or six hours has gone until you've actually nailed the shot from when you started setting it up. Um, another studio shot um, on that one, on a fashion shot. This is some recent work. Again, here I've been um, experimenting a little bit more with much harder lighting. So I'm using very, very hard pinpoint lighting uh, on the model to create a very crisp sort of sunlight look, but then carefully controlling how that feathers off um, and you can see on the hands there, the light doesn't really reach down to the hands. It only hits the, the head and the upper part of the, the cape. Um, here's where Lee materials come into play a lot with my work. And this is with diffusion. So the lovely graduated lighting effect that you see on the lipstick on the um, vertical tube column of the lipstick, that graduated lighting effect is created by diffusing soft boxes through the diffusion material because if you use a soft box on its own then you're going to get a very homogeneous light source that's like a solid stripe of light and generally on product photography you don't want that solid stripe of light you want a little bit of graduation because it makes products feel and look a little bit more luxurious um, the next shot is a good example of that because this is actually a combination of two images because I'm using very hard lighting to create a sunlight shadow type look on the base surface. But that type of lighting would not work for the chrome caps. So the chrome caps have been lit separately in another shot using the Lee diffusion material to get the lovely gradation. And then those two images are then combined in post to make the the one final image. Other shots we get pretty much nailed in camera in one go. Um, here, uh, very complex lighting setup in the end for this particular shot of this rather expensive racing bike. Um, but if you actually start analyzing that shot and looking really closely at all the, the details of the lighting on the tires, on the top of the seat, on the top of the uh, frame crossbar, et cetera, and you start looking at it, you realize actually there's an awful lot of uh, lighting going on in the shot. Here's another uh, new recent uh, one from a new fashion series that we've been working on where we've been introducing and building sets. So we built the wooden frame uh, that's there in the background. And then um, we used all these uh, little ping pong balls in the shot as well, bouncing around to add another element of uh, dynamics to the shot. Uh, here's some of my client work. So this one was an advert for Hugo Boss um, for glasses. And again, if you look very carefully at the lighting on the glasses, especially across the bridge of the nose part of the glasses, you'll see that lovely shimmering quality to the way the light gradates away. You can't achieve that with a softbox because the light's too homogenous. So this is where we pass the softbox light through Lee filters, diffusion material to achieve that gradation uh, look to the lighting. Um, here's some more um, splash work. I do a lot of um, high speed liquid stuff, fast flash durations. Again, um, mixing hard lighting with uh, projection uh, lighting um, tools and a mixture of soft lighting as well. As a matter of fact, this one has a combination of hard and soft light at the same time um, so that it could mostly be captured in one image. Some shots are much, much simpler. Um, this one was a particular favorite of mine from earlier in the year or late last year. I can't remember quite when it was. Um, this actually only used two lights. Um, one key light from the left, one light on the background. And then, um, it, you know, the, the style of the lighting and the look of it was, was done in a way to sort of represent that sort of Baroque, old Dutch masters, still life uh, paintings. And it was literally all done in camera. The difficult part of that shot was the three to four weeks of preparation we had for the food by keeping it in plastic crates. 
and keeping it warm and damp to get it to go moldy and, and deteriorate so that all of the, the whole shot and the scene is about decay. Here again, quite a simple lighting setup, just a single para 88 above my model and then um, a background light as well. This one actually uses Godox lights. So um, many people know me as an ambassador for Bron Color Lighting, uh, but occasionally our audience, on, especially on our education platform, want to see me using other lights. So we show exactly what's possible with other brands of lights uh, and that when you understand lighting and you know how to control it, you can still create some um, good work. And, and this was actually using three of the cheapest, some of the cheapest Godox lights there are. This one was a little bit more complicated. Um, in, 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 interestingly, it looks less complicated than that one, but actually to get that softer light over such a broad, big area um, is quite testing um, to do. So I was quite happy with that one. Um, I really enjoy uh, automotive photography, especially motorbikes more than cars, because I've got quite a passion for motorbikes. This is a Harley Davidson custom uh, night rod machine. And um, I really liked the back view of it with the exhaust side and the, the large back tire. So this again, uses a mixture of gradation lighting, small spotlights in key areas. And what you see in the shot is one photo. The only thing that's been removed in post-production is there were a couple of lights sticking in close to the bike that were protruding into the shot so those have been removed, but the actual bike and the lighting on the bike is as it was um, in camera. Here's another. So that was that was uh, all lit in one shot, Carl? Yeah, all lit in one wow. shot. Um, I think there was about nine or 10 lights used. So obviously it's not an easy task, yeah. but you know, I very much prefer to get my lighting as close yeah. to perfect in one shot. So the only thing that was different in that was that there was one or two lights that were quite close to the back tire mm -hmm. and there was one light laying on the floor on the right coming in for the exhaust. So they were actually in the shot so that I take those out and then I take another shot as yeah. a blank to blend those out. I'm, I'm amazed same, that's one shot with the amount of different angles and, and shapes and textures you've got going on there. It's incredible. Yeah, thank you. No, and um, I, you know, I always endeavor to, to try and get as close to perfect in one shot if I can and the same um, the same with this one as well on this um, rather nice uh, KTM RC8 here. Um, car photography uh, as well. Um, this one actually only uses one. This is actually only four lights for that shot. One of the most interesting lighting elements in this is actually a large mirror that was used at the front to bounce some of the top lighting back down to underlight the grill to make it look a little bit more aggressive. Um, again, more sort of um, product work with water, liquids. I'm using Lee gels here. So as you can see, the blue tint on the water was afforded by using Lee colored gel over, over some of my lighting. Almost uh, looks like, uh, look like a blue silk almost, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. and. Um, that blue gel was applied only to the light that's coming through the scrim at the back for illuminating and reflecting off the surface of the water. All of the lighting that's actually hitting the bottle was normal lighting, except on the Tom Ford label, that's also picking up some of the blue lighting because its angle of reflectance is the same as the water, but that worked out quite nicely because you've got the Tom Ford, which is quite a gold yellow color, and then that's juxtaposing quite nicely against the bluer tone um, that's picking up on the label. Well, one thing that's always confused me when you're using gels on the lights is, is the intensity of the light. Because you can always, if you turn the light up too high, you basically lose the color in the gel. That's been my Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You, you, you can overwash the color out. And if you're too low in intensity, the color can be too rich. So you've got to get the exposure value just about right. But again, I just eyeball it, go up a few tenths, look at it and just keep testing until it looks where I want it to look. You can also polarize it as well. So you put a polarizer on the camera and then you can increase that intensity of saturation a little bit 
um, as well oh, on, um, on some of the light. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. Very clever. Um, here, this uses some quite interesting techniques because we've got to get light very precisely controlled on the label. And then we've got to get light into the bottle and through the bottle. Um, and then a nice little glow of light around the bottle on the um, little acrylic tiles. Um, so um, quite technically challenged, ta challenging some of these shots. Again, uh, liquid shots. The, ob the object obviously is not um, floating in the air because we couldn't throw it in the air and expect to catch it perfectly with the water splash. So in these instances, we use acrylic rods and we glue the product to transparent acrylic rods. Obviously, you still see the acrylic rod, but what the transparent acrylic rod allows for is the light still to get through so that you don't end up with any shadows in, in unwanted places. And then, for example, with this shot, it's just a case of throwing multiple, multiple batches of liquid water at the product until you get the splash result that you like. Um, those again, acrylic rods, Carl, are they, I'm assuming they're round, are they rather than the square? Uh, no, I get, well, I've got a variety. I've got round ones, I've got flat ones, I've got ones that are just like rulers that I just get cut to size by uh, um, sign makers, sign service companies that deal oh, with okay. acrylic, that have laser cutters, they cut them for me. Uh, sometimes when I buy bulk acrylic orders, because I buy a lot of acrylic for coloured pastel backgrounds, um, acrylic for diffusion material, frosted acrylic, you know, well, as a matter of fact, in the shot we're looking at now, that the, uh, the thing that the glasses are actually sitting on two very um, stressed, bent pieces of acrylic there that are actually forming the, uh, the set, if you like, for that particular product shot. I see. Um, this was a very complex shot that used um, a lot of different lights, mostly Fresnel lighting and very small spotlights to create this sort of Renaissance feel lighting style and coloration. This was shot as a charity project for a, um, a marine pollution or anti-marine pollution campaign, plastic pollution campaign. Um, and I was very pleased with the success of this image. It went all over the world, was used by many agencies and organizations and scientists and groups and um, it was went on to the um, BBC News um, social media and had over a million views. So it was uh, it was good that it raised uh, awareness. And it was also shortlisted for a pre Picte um, award as well. So um, I was very pleased with, uh, with what we did on that. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about pre visualization because this is something that's very important in my work. And I mentioned about concept completion at the start. Um, Pre-visualization is something where you, you try to decide the image before you start shooting it. And you start thinking about how the, the light is going to work, how the shot's going to come together. And the next image is a really good example because what we have here is the same model in each shot. She's literally got the same pose. She's at the same angle. She's got her shoulders exposed, her head's at the same tilt. Everything about her is very much the same, yet both shots have a completely different atmosphere and mood because of the lighting. And it is the lighting that dictates the emotion and the mood. So one image which is using a very soft rim lighting and then a very gentle fill lighting, a soft fill, and the other image is using a very hard lighting representing more of a sunlight and then a shadow. So even though we have the same model, the same pose, the same angle, the same crop. We have two very different images just because of the lighting. And this is why pre-visualizing images for me is very, very important. It's a process of actually working out what you want to do before you do it so that you end up with what you are hoping to achieve. Because a lot of photographers, they sort of play with lights and they experiment, and that's good in some cases. But the way I work is very much more methodical. I decide the mood of the shot that I want to achieve and what I want it to look like. I sketch it and then I execute it based on the lighting style that I'm going to go for. And those two shots are a good example of how lighting styles can change the feeling of the shot, even when all the other variables are, are very similar. Do you, do you um, think that pre-visualization 
um, process that you've got you, that that comes from your film days. It does because you used to have to do a lot more planning when you were working in five by four film um, because you didn't have that luxury of seeing the images live on a computer. And we used to shoot Polaroid test shots just to be sure. But when you were doing splash shots or liquids back in those days, you didn't know whether you got it or not. You just kept shooting film. And obviously you were planning everything to the finest detail to, to aim for success. But yeah, I, I maintain that process today. And even though some of my sketches are quite rudimentary like this, by just the process of sketching it down allows me to think about my lighting, where my lighting is going to go, what focal length am I going to need? What's, you know, how am I going to achieve this? And that thought process, um, I find, you know, works really well for me. It doesn't work well for every other photographer, because some photographers do shoot a little bit more ad hoc and a bit more random. But for me, pre-visualization to a fine degree works well. So here's the original previous sketch on the left. And then there's the final resulting image on the right. Uh, here's another great example. This one was uh, commissioned for Hasselblad when they launched the H6 camera. So um, I was um, commissioned to shoot some publicity images for that. And um, we decided to shoot the number six as a, a, in a liquid form. And we shot it in orange because the H6 launched with a new orange button as a shutter button. And then through color theory and color science, we identified the exact opposite color of that orange, which is that blue. So we made the blue, that background painted the back of our background that color. But on the left is the previs sketch of what I was trying to achieve with the number six. Now, obviously, it didn't come out exactly like that, but the process, as you can see, the resulting image is still effective. And the organic form of liquid, you know, means you don't never know really what you're going to get. Um, and it actually took two shots. So there's two sweeps in there. We couldn't get the number six in one go. That would have been almost impossible. So we did one sweep of liquid over and over again to get the larger curve. And then we did uh, an almost circular curve for uh, the second shot. So um, that is actually made up of two, possibly three shots. I can't quite remember. Um, here's another one from that campaign. And there's the pre-visual shot on the left that was sketched out as the concepts um, for what we were hoping to achieve. Obviously, it doesn't look exactly the same as what we achieved, but you can understand the, you know, what you're trying to go for um, by doing that pre-visualization. Now, interestingly, even with client work, this is often how you operate in commercial photography because the work that you're shooting is dictated by an art director. So they give you a brief and they give you mood boards and ideas of the sort of look they want, the clothing, the style, and a sketch of the shot. So if you remember the golf guy there with the golf club bent over his nose in anger, and then also you'll see this guy with the steam coming out of his ears, which was the previs from the art director. So these, this is what I'm given as the previs from the client. And then my job is to execute it. And then that's what ends up as the final shot. So generally in the commercial world, in commercial photography, advertising photography, especially, you're often working to pre-visualization anyway. It's just not your pre-visualization, it's someone else's. And then your job is to execute that pre-visualization and make that, um, make that sketch become a reality, basically. Um, here's how I um, often try to teach my students about the process for successful photography. Um, if you look at the triangle on the left, for me, successful photography comes down to uh, these three things. You've got passion, pre-visualization, and knowledge. I just noticed knowledge is spelt incorrectly there, but ignore that. Um, so you have those three cornerstones to making a successful image. And if those three things work well, then you can result in a successful image. And if you don't result in a successful image, you go back to that triangle, and it's going to be one of those three things that has failed. Either you didn't pre-visualize the shot correctly to really work out what was necessary, or you pre-visualized it really well, but you didn't have the knowledge 
of the lighting or the materials or the, the set or the composition. So knowledge may have been lacking or you didn't have the passion to actually execute it properly. If you have those three cornerstones covered as a photographer, good pre-visualization, extreme passion for wanting to succeed with that image, and you have the knowledge to succeed, you're not, you know, you're not lacking in a certain area, then when you have those three cornerstones nailed, 90% of the time you will result in a successful image. And, and this is what I teach my students about that process. But that is um, a really useful graphic because I know I've had images fail and I know which one of the three I was lacking where they failed. So yeah, that, that is really- yeah, and, it, and it's 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 interesting because you can literally narrow it down to one yeah. of those three things or, you know, or it's a subsection of one of those three things. So uh, this image was a very complex image and this was shot entirely in camera. There's no post-production. This is what was captured the explosion or splash of the paint there really i i, I previs this shot but then i had to think well how the hell can we make it happen but the process of pre-visualization is what allows you to figure out how to do things and then it was through that pre-visualization that we realized we could build a contraption that had a trap door that would release these billiard balls and these billiard balls would drop right down exactly in line with our paint pots Brilliant. they would all they would all fall simultaneously land in the paint pots at the same time and then we only had to get the timing right to get the splash um exactly right and um you know even though this was shot as a personal project and as a shot for our training the beauty is that when you execute shots really well like this they still become uh, economically viable because that image is sold um, time and time again. Um, various clients, I think even Sony have bought it uh, previously for uh, you know promoting their television Bravia or whatever screens, etc. So you know it's not wasted. So here's a little video, and you can see the billiard balls boom drop into the pots perfectly there. So you know that process of pre-visualization for me is what leads to a greater chance of success. Um, some images uh, are shot with a mixture of um, photography and post-production. So the floor in this shot is not real. That's a stock shot from Adobe stock. The reflection in the floor is post-production that I've done in Photoshop, the reflection of the car, the very weak reflection, the little bit of motion blur on the, um, on the wheels and on the, um, the floor the car itself was shot exactly like that against black and the lighting on the car and everything is as it was in camera D deep down carl when you can't do it all in camera is there a tiny bit of you that goes oh, frustrated it's always it's always a little bit frustrating but you know sometimes some things can't be achieved in camera like i can't get that car to be flying around my studio in motion and it would be too logistically difficult to have to create a floor that looked like that in the studio far too expensive sure. for the sake of that one shot so you know you just generally weigh up the circumstances where it yeah. is feasible or it's not feasible sure. um, and 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 you know you roll with uh, with whatever you can um, this is a great example of a single shot in camera though so this one has been created entirely in camera uses a combination of continuous lighting and flash lighting on the face with a projection attachment just highlighting a very key area of the face this image actually um, utilizes a number of optical illusion tricks as well to do with luminosity values uh, and color um, to make it actually a little bit frustrating to look at when you look at the, um, the body part of the image. You may not be able to pick that up looking at it on Facebook Live, but if you have a look at it on my commercial website at um, a uh, later time, then you'll, you'll see what I mean. Uh, here's another example where I try to employ unusual techniques. So here we've got very, very faint fill-in flash on the model. Uh, and then I'm using a long exposure and I'm using a laser pointer and I'm running the laser pointer over the body of the model rapidly on a 10 second exposure. And that laser pointer then records as all those green lines on the shot. So I'm always looking for, you know, unusual 
ways of doing things with light as in that one there and as in this one here. I'm assuming with the lasers, you obviously have to be really careful with people's eyes. Hence why we put sunglasses on her and got her to keep yeah. the get, we got her to keep her eyes closed. Yeah. So she just had to maintain a still pose for that shot. Um, and, and as I say, yeah, she kept her kept her eyes shot. Uh, fast liquid work. The one on the left was a, a paint covered balloon popped, and the one on the right is um, two whiskey glasses smashing together, um, captured in one shot. No post production at all on the one on the right. Um, again, you know, careful control of lighting here, in this case, rim lighting, but this is actually two shots. So one for the bottle and one for the glass, because if we had left the glass there, the rim lighting wouldn't have been able to hit the bottle on the left-hand side of the bottle. And then the label is lit with um, a very precise projection light that's softened out just to give a nice uh, lighting on the label. Um, this is all shot in camera. Um, I often, again, try to add a bit of dynamics and, and the model uh, jumping in my shots is, is a common theme in, uh, in a lot of my work. Uh, here, building a set in the studio um, to create a mood and create a theme um, for uh, this client shoot for this um, lingerie uh, brand. Um, more um, mostly done in camera here, a little bit of post-production done, done to make the dog expression look as surprised as the model and then the same on the parrot the parrot was given a, a more surprised expression um, as well to match with the uh, with the model for those adverts uh, some of my work uh, is not it's not all shot on medium format this is actually shot on 35 mil this was shot on a canon with a canon 100 mil macro lens so you know no matter what camera equipment you're using even what lighting you're using, you can still get good results if you apply the techniques uh, well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's more about the preparation, the styling and the, you know, getting the right props and, and, and getting the right arrangements. Again, sim simple lighting. We've seen the one on the right. And the reason I brought the image up again here is because this image on the right actually only used one light. And, you know, I often get people um come to me and they say oh you know it's, you know you can get great results because you've got a studio full of bronze gear or medium format gear and and whilst it, it's true i do get some great results from that that doesn't mean to say you can't get great results with lower or lesser amounts of equipment so for example that shot on the right uses one background light coming through some diffusion material because it only needed to be backlit because it was glass and liquid and that's all the lighting it needed um, so, so, you know, very simple. The shot on the left was a bare bulb studio lamp with a piece of cardboard in front of it. So again, you know, there, there is a lot you can do with minimal lighting um, that, um, you know, a lot of people use the excuse, oh, I haven't got enough kit, I haven't got enough lights, so I haven't got the right lens. And, you know, I, I don't really accept that. And I won't even accept that on my education platform. We try to give as many examples as possible um, on Carl Taylor Education, where we show what you can achieve with minimal kit if necessary. Here's another great example. This is just one light. It looks like a lot of lights because of the rim lighting all around the model, but it's actually only one light used and there's no post-production very little maybe just a little bit of contrast work on there as well so you know it's through knowledge that you you can build this stuff up oh that's a re repeat we don't want that um and then you know talking about through knowledge that greater level of knowledge of understanding of lighting um will lead you to realize things about physics that you know you can apply to your lighting so for example here um, you would expect if you move, moved a point light source further away that you're going to increase contrast because that's what the law of physics would dictate. Um, and the, um, the, the, the light would be getting smaller, so therefore it would be coming harder. 
that would be the case if you were in space or in a completely blackened room. But when you're working in a white box studio environment, when you move the light further away, then the inverse square law changes and therefore more of the background becomes lit. So whilst the shadow under the chin has become sharper than the original one, um, the uh, overall lighting in the room changes because of the inverse square law. And it's this understanding, this deeper understanding of lighting that I've really tried to apply in the last 10 years. And it's things like why, for example, is the highlight in the light in the eye in the uh, separate shot there? Why is it so much brighter than the highlight in the shot of the eye on my right hand side? And the same, for example, would you know as a commercial photographer, if the client wanted the glossy highlight of your light on the bottle to be brighter or less, even though the exposure on the label has to be correct. So what is it about lighting control that can dictate the luminosity value of the reflection from a gloss surface that is different to the reflection from matte surfaces? And it's this sort of greater understanding of light that then allows you to apply more finesse, if you like, with, uh, with your lighting, which is what I try to do uh, with my uh, my work, my education platform, and with um, with my commercial work as well. And um, some of that lighting can be like in this one is actually just umbrellas in this case. So again, you know, people say, oh, it's all fine. You know, you're using fancy parabolic lights. So again, we show exactly what can be done with, you know, three or four silver umbrellas and what can be achieved in that respect um, as well. So um, just a couple more shots to um, finish off here. Um, and then we're going to move on very briefly on to some landscape work. So this is again where Lee filters comes in very handy because I've got graduated filters and 0.9 ND filters allowing me to arrive at shutter speeds, you know, in the two to four second range, which allows me to get that beautiful sweep of water uh, running up the beach there. Same in this shot here, normally in my landscape work, I'll run in the sort of two second to four second exposure range, as you can see with the uh, trail of the water here. So I normally let the water run up towards me and around my legs and feet, and then I'll activate the shutter when the water starts to drain back down the beach. The other thing with this sort of seascape work is it's actually often better done when there's a little bit of wind so that you're getting slightly bigger waves coming so you actually get some motion of water coming up the beach to achieve that. Um, another little tip for you as well, for example, always looking for a point of interest in the shot. So if I don't have a point of interest, I'll go and get one. So that boulder that you see there, that's the sort of key point of interest, that wasn't there. I went and got it from 10, 15 meters away, picked it up and put it there so that I have a point of interest in my shot. Here's another example. This is actually shot more in middle of the daytime. And here I'm using the Lee big stopper filter, which blocks out 10 stops of light. And that allows me to get exposure times of a minute to two minutes during the middle of the day. So what's happening here is the clouds are moving in the quite a strong breeze, uh, but they end up recording as sort of streaks of light and streaks of lines of light and cloud because the, we're recording for a two minute um, exposure during the daytime. And we can only achieve that with the Lee Big Stopper. Other techniques that are good for the Lee Big Stopper and um, long exposures is I've done shots, for example, in busy cities uh, like in Paris at the Louvre, I remember we did a great example where there's so many people walking around the Louvre pyramid, the glass pyramid, but we wanted to get more of an empty scene. It was sunset. We had the sun setting through the pyramid, yet there was all these tourists moving and walking around. Pop on a big stopper or a couple of layers of um, three stop filters and then run a one minute exposure and all of these people moving around basically dissolve into the shot and then you can end up with a fairly empty scene even in a busy city so oh, um, this is another technique that I like to apply 
uh, which is a great one for you know avoiding the crowds, even though the crowds are there, if you like. The, the blue, um, um, I, the blue, the blue tone of that last shot, Carl. Is that is that a result of the big stopper and its infamous? I think it might be cast? partially. <laughs> it was quite a bluey, cloudy, light day anyway, but it may have been enhanced. I mean, the big stoppers aren't perfectly neutral like the IRND filters. The IRND filters are absolutely bang on neutral, and I use them in the studio all the time. Um, but the big stoppers are not quite as accurate on the neutral, so it may be a little bit from that. Uh, finally, I've just got a couple more slides to go. I want to finish off about post-production. Um, I've got two images here. The one on the left has the post-production and the one on the right has no post-production because a lot of people also accuse photographers that you know produce good work they say oh it's all post-production or it's all the kit and all it is and here i want to demonstrate well actually it's not much, much post-production at all it's just a careful application of post-production so the image on the left left has burn and dodge post-production the image on the right is the raw file and if i overlay them so there's the raw file and then with the post-production you can see the changes there so they're minor but they make a difference you know but it is not all about the post-production. It's actually about understanding what is needed just to refine the image a little bit further. This is another image where I get regular comments about, oh, what post-production did you use to achieve that image? Well, the next shot, that's the raw file. You can see the camera lighting stands in the shot on the left there. You can see the cable on the floor. And that is the shot that was captured in camera. And then the post reduction, you can see a little bit of reshaping on the model of the body, uh, on the body uh, of the model, sorry, and a little bit of enhancement in the color. So it's not always about post production. For me, it's about how much can I get right in camera and then finish it off for the last five or 10% with post production. Um, some shots like this where this shot was for msa fire safety equipment here i'm using lee filters for the slight blue gel on the right and the warm gel on the left um, of the, the the model's body and then we had to represent the kit that he was wearing as a floating um diagram type thing so we had to use lots of uh, rods and c-stands to hold it all those had to be retouched out of the shot but that really was the only retouching all of it was lit very, very carefully. Other shots like this, basically completely executed in camera, with the exception of the one on the model on the right, just a little bit of burn and dodging to take some of the creases out of the jumper, um, a little bit of color work, things like that. Um, other shots like this executed in camera. Most of my Photoshop work is just burn and dodge work. Um, that's really most of my post production. Um, again, bit of burn and dodge work in that shot um the final shot i've got to show here is again this is sort of the the art of simplicity um during lockdown when i was only able to work in the studio on my own i set about tasking myself to shoot various simple still live uh, still life shots so i just got got a bunch of various pasta spaghetti started making arrangements and coming up with you know nice compositions with them and then this was just lit with one light um, and it was all about the shadows and the play of light and creating that feeling of sunlight and then there is some post-production just to clean up little you know defects in the pasta or little bits of dust and a bit of burn and dodge to finish the shot so again you know you can achieve really interesting stuff with just one light but, you know, it's more, as I say, about the preparation and the pre-visualization. So I spent more time, you know, arranging the shot than obviously shooting it. So it's, you know, it just took hours, a couple of hours for me to get my arrangement right and everything in position with tweezers and very careful moving things around, then applying the lighting. And then when I'm happy with that, execute the shot and then a little bit of finishing it off in um, in post production it is and very tempting is, to get all the kit out and dive straight in but but obviously it does pay to think about it a absolutely. little bit more absolutely yeah absolutely it does pay to just give it a bit more thought on how you're going to execute it before you before you jump in so that is the um the end of my um slideshow i've just uh, stopped sharing my screen so um Hopefully you enjoyed that um, 
presentation and got an idea of how I work. Thank you, Carl, for joining us today. That was superb. Um, insight into your creative processes and techniques. I've, I've certainly learned <laughs> quite a few new things there, um, having attempted a few similar images myself and failed miserably. So yeah, I've definitely learned some new things there. Thank you for that. Um, no it's one of the things I think that come across uh, from hearing you talk is just the absolute pure passion that you have for creating images uh, and understanding yeah. light. And um, yeah, that, 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 that to me is what photography is all about as well. And it's, it's something that you never really stop learning as, as you're, you're a, a fantastic example of that. You've been doing this for how many years? 30 plus years? Nearly, now? nearly 30 years professionally. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, a long time, but yeah, no, I've, I mean, actually, interestingly, I in, increased my knowledge of lighting dramatically in the last 10 years. And then now that I'm happy with understanding what I know about light in the last few years, the last five years, especially, I've actually been studying neuroscience on oh, wow. how humans perceive and process images. So a lot of my research and studying um, for the, what I create these days is very much more to do with the human visual process and how we absorb images, how we read images, why we read them a certain way which colors we respond to, why we respond to diagonal lines more um, uh, in, 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 um, uh, as a dynamic um, visual than a horizontal line. And there's very specific neurological reasons for this that are, are fascinating the, the deeper you dig. So the last five years, I've actually been looking into a lot more of that. And, and I've got to say, I was I was put on to those concepts initially five or six years ago by another really um, great photographer, Tim Flack, um, oh, who's an yeah. um, uh, animal uh, yes. photographer. He, he does a lot of animal portraits in studio, fine art stuff. Tim Flack, I was having a conversation with him and he uh, introduced me to these concepts to do with neuroscience and how we process images. And then I've taken that uh, you know on board myself and then been researching it and tim and i discuss it regularly and we actually run a workshop together oh, wow. um once a year although we haven't run it for the last year or so because of yeah. covid but um yeah we run a workshop on um that exact uh topic as well oh wow um, that, that sounds studio. fascinating yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's interesting. But if anyone, um, uh, you know, wants to see any more information on the education side, we've got the education um, platform at carltaylereducation.com and my commercial work is at carltaylor.com. You will be pleased to know, Carl, I've probably purchased every single one of your workshops and training materials. So, <laughs> All right, good, good. Well, now they're all like, they're all available. Everything we've ever done now is because yeah. we do a monthly membership now. Yeah. So you can literally watch the lot now. I've um, I've got all the original DVDs when you were still selling Oh, wow. DVDs, right. So, yeah, right. Go, you may have some, them. we don't even have any more. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they, they yeah. were incredibly useful and, and your thought process and the way you approach uh, creating an image very much fitted with with my style as well so I found it incredibly useful and you do explain stuff in a very easy to understand way and some of the concepts that you do explain are incredibly complicated technically but you do mm. break it down nicely for people to to be able to understand and take it on board so yeah Thank that is you. very very good and and also even with your, your training material I've, I learned quite a lot from some of the free stuff that you've put out on YouTube as well yeah and that's what initially yeah, put... that's that's how I found you yeah, no, we, we use YouTube as a way of putting some basic stuff out there to, um, you know, make people aware of, of, of what we do. Yeah, perfect. Right, lovely. Well, I, th I think we've reached our time limit. We're an yep. hour and three minutes in, so we've done well. It flew by, absolutely <laughs> shot by. Uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, I hope you've learned something new. I certainly have, that's for sure. And uh, we do hope to make these uh, Facebook Live events a regular thing in the future. So if you keep an eye on the Robert White Facebook page and uh, any new ones that we're planning should uh, pop up on there on the events section. Um, there is also a little treat, courtesy of Carl's initials. Uh, we're, we're giving a 5% uh, discount code off of absolutely everything on the Robert White website. So uh, if you want to make a note of KTE uh, hyphen RW5, uh, that'll give you 5% off of, of anything online. Uh, any problems using the code, just, just give us a call and we'll sort that out for you. Uh, thanks again, Carl. Um, fantastic to, to watch you and hear you talk Thank about you. your images.
Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Cheers, See you Tom. next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.